Hello again, and welcome to Thoughtful Thursday. So we've talked about a few different religious traditions, but also religious groups already. The Jesuits, the Dominicans, the Franciscans. Today, we're going to talk about the group that started it all. Today, we're going to talk about the Benedictines. Often recognized as the father of Western monasticism, St. Benedict, hence the name Benedictines, began the call up practice of having persons live in a community, religious persons, priests and brothers, live in a community according to a central rule. Though there were certainly monks prior to Benedict, one can think of the Desert Fathers in the early church, Benedict really was the one who institutionalized, if you will, persons coming together in a community to live together, to work together, to pray together. So I mentioned the idea of a rule. Benedict wrote the rule, which was understood to be a set of guiding principles, teaching principles for all of those who would follow after him. Following Benedict's rule for his religious group, the Benedictines, many of the major religious groups would adopt something very similar. So we can see then sort of a lineage tracing from Benedict of all of our major religious organizations. I mentioned that the Dominicans, the Franciscans, were mendicant orders. The reason that you had the growth of these orders dedicated to poverty, to preaching, was because they saw themselves as needing to reform the institution of monasticism. That is, the institution that started all the way back with St. Benedict. Why is it that we should be interested in Benedict's rule when it comes to contemplation? Well, we're going to talk less about the rule today as being a way of contemplating, and more about why it is Benedict thought he needed these ways of governing all these guys living together. The rule was very, very much pragmatic. That is, Benedict wanted to tell people, if you're all going to come live together in tiny little rooms, the monks call them cells, and you're all going to share meals together, do masses together, work in the fields or in shops together, we need to understand what it means to live in a community. We need to understand how to divide up tasks fairly. We need to understand how to deal with tensions that might come up between persons. We need to understand how it is we can live well together. I'd like to suggest that Benedict's rule, relevant to contemplation, should be something that we reflect upon. The content of it, if not the rule itself. We need to think about how we do live in communities together. Now, some of these communities are smaller than others. Maybe you have one or two roommates. Maybe you live with your family. Just come into campus. Maybe you uh, live by yourself. You're still gonna be interacting with people in a workplace, in a school. You're still gonna be interacting with people when you're driving on the streets, when you're going to a mall, when you're going to a supermarket. The point is we are constantly dealing with interpersonal relationships. Benedict established his rule because he knew that there needs to be guiding principles for persons being with each other to ensure that those persons are acting well. So today I'm suggesting less of a way of broadening our uh, manners of well interacting with the world through contemplation, more so I'm suggesting something we should contemplate on. Following the example of Benedict and his rule, I think we need to look at how it is that we uh, live in our communities, how it is we interact with those persons that we are communally connected to. Benedict proposed the rule not because he was some kind of authoritarian priest on a power trip, but rather because he cared about the people who would be living with him, and he wanted them to be able to live, for the most part, in harmony, live well together, live in a way that supported each other. So. How is it then that we can take the example of St. Benedict and apply it to ourselves? It could be something as simple as doing the dishes when they pile up in the sink. No, you didn't cook your roommate's pot of soup. Well, you could still wash the pot. It could be something as simple as like helping out your parents with a younger sibling. Need to drive them to school, to dance class, your classes are online. That's something you can do to help out your community. We can take a wider view on community. Doing service. Maybe picking up trash off the side of the street. I'd say going to a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen normally, but, well, we're not in normal times. 
but could you call to a senior citizen who's been stuck inside since February to give him a voice to, to hear, someone to speak to? Could you arrange to help deliver food to persons who are in, say, assisted living homes? All of this has to do with supporting community as well. So for today, let's reflect on how it is we are connected with others so that by doing something for our community, we can also learn how to be better in that community in the hopes that if we together all are all better as a community, the community will be directed towards what is best for each of us, towards supporting each of us, and so ultimately toward bringing all of us together in a way that makes life a little bit easier, a little bit more peaceful, and a lot better. <laughs>